Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. You know, thanks to fossil fuels like oil and natural gas, we're living in an energy peak moment, unlike anything we've seen in our history. Our, uh, our whole world is built on, on the basis of these cheap and abundant natural resources. Automobiles, the millions of plastic products that we make, um, traveling all over the world, the fertilizers and the pesticides that are used to farm, uh, our big industrial farms. We're so used to it. Some observers feel that we're coming right up to a peak in global oil production, which is also called peak oil, maybe as soon as the next five years. We don't have um, an energy replacement that we can just swap in for natural gas and oil. And observers say it's also going to take us maybe 5, 10, 20 years to build the infrastructure. Peak moment is about our community's responses, individual responses, to a changing energy future. I've got a couple guests in the studio to uh, talk with about it today, but first I'm going to give you the news with Rick, our news person. Go for it, Rick. Thanks, Julia. I'll start tonight by saying that uh, peak oil prices today were at the highest they've been since the Katrina hurricane. They are now at uh, $68 for light crude and $66 for Brent crude. So we're seeing an increase. We're going to see increases of the cost of gasoline at the gas pumps. And this could be a continuing trend and we'll continue to report on that, of course, as time passes. Next, starting with international news, you might have already read that there was an issue at the first of the year with Russia and the Ukraine over natural gas. Uh, Russia literally turned off the natural gas to the Ukraine when the Ukraine refused to accept the 450 percent increase in price that Russia was demanding. This caused a ripple effect in Europe and especially in the United Kingdom when the Ukraine started to take some of the uh, gas that was intended for, for those places for their own use because they were literally getting cold. So that's uh, another issue going on uh, in the world with uh, the availability and the, the cost of natural gas and the impacts that it has and, and how they ripple across the countries. Also, uh, in the uh, former Soviet country of Georgia, the, the headline says Georgia shivers as Russia and Azerbaijan rush to restore gas. Just a few days ago, uh, saboteurs exploded two Russian pipelines and an electricity transmission line. So they're having difficulties there getting the adequate needs that they have for their natural gas supplies. Also, it was just reported uh, last fall that uh, Kuwait's uh, Bergen oil field just peaked. So it's the second largest oil field in the world behind the Gawar field in Saudi Arabia. Also, just out today in Kuwait, there was a uh, announcement from uh, London that said that uh, Kuwait's oil reserves were only half of those uh, officially stated. And this was according to internal uh, Kuwaiti records seen by an inter industry newsletter, Petroleum I Intelligence Weekly. So apparently, they don't have quite as much oil as they said they did or that they thought they did. Moving over to the UK, in Kinsale, Ireland, there's been a continuing effort to get away from fossil fuels. And they have uh, unanimously adopted a motion to support the efforts of a nonprofit company called Transition Design to help transition that town. They've also done a number of other things through the local university there, and they seem to be working very hard to get transition from a petroleum fossil fuel dependent energy supply. Closer to home, there has been a lot of talk lately and CBS actually spent quite a bit of time on a 60 Minutes episode yesterday on the Alberta toil sand, excuse me, Alberta oil sands. And they've basically been going to a gold rush situation there where they're now saying that they have reserves that are in excess of what Saudi Arabia has for oil. Uh, another important thing coming out of the United States is that there has been a first hearing in Congress of peak oil. 
And this was sponsored by Roscoe Bartlett and included speakers um, like Tom Udall. And this is actually finally bringing us to a point where the national government is paying attention to peak oil. So I think this is a pretty good progress. That's all we have time for tonight. So now back to Jenea and her guests. Thanks, Rick. It's heartening to hear that other communities like Ireland are starting to look at how do we reduce our dependency on fossil fuels. My guests today are Anna Reynolds Trabuco and Bill Trabuco, who are the owners of Lyndon Lee Ranch um, here in Nevada County, Western Nevada County. You um, embarked on buying this ranch and are using it sort of in an unusual way compared to many of our ranchers. Tell us what you've been doing. Well, uh, I think the key difference between our ranch and many others currently is that our ranch is under a conservation easement with the Nevada County Land Trust. It is a working agricultural conservation easement, which means that it is set up to engender agricultural uses in perpetuity. Now, does this mean that the land trust owns this land? What is a con what's a conservation easement? Actually, a conservation easement is a um, almost torturously contrived document. It uh, took us a lot longer to arrive at this. Um, a misconception sometimes uh, in the case of conservation easements is this is something that's imposed from without. In fact, the landowner crafts the conservation easement. So you, you've crafted it. We decide what you want, we want to have happen to this land and the entity, Nevada County Land Trust, in fact, helps and will carry on our desires for the land into the future, essentially in perpetuity, which is one of the important provisions of conservation easements. Why did you put on a conservation easement? Well, it's a very property owner driven document. Mm -hmm. it's, it's created entirely by the owners in exactly the way that they wish. And when we first started, we weren't really looking for a large piece of land, just maybe enough to be self-sufficient or somewhat self-sufficient on. We, in the process of looking for our land, we found this ranch and it was much larger than expected, but we fell in love with it mm -hmm. and could not, <laughs> not be involved with it. And we realized with such a large piece, it was a meaningful part of the South Yuba River watershed and it was also equally meaningful to keep it in agriculture as it had been for over a hundred years prior to our ownership. Wow, that long. So it became more of a community and future-oriented project than we had initially been thinking of when we first looked for land. Well, when, you know, it's sort of a personal take on it though, once we'd spent time on the land and seen it a bit through a few seasons, you just kind of fall in love with it mm. and say, this needs to be preserved. This land need, has, has a purpose here being what it is. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting to think, you know, well, the land kind of took over us maybe <laughs> instead of us taking over the land. This might be a good moment for us to let our viewers see a little bit of your land since... Um, let them see the place we are speaking of. That you fell in love with. Yes? Mm -hmm. Well, behind me there's a nice scene of a few cows just barely visible and distant meadows, blue oak trees. This is what Lyndon Lee Conservation Easement is all about. And it's a little hard to preserve 800 acre plots like Lyndon Lee, which is what we would actually prefer to have in this area because we feel it's important to have open space and agriculture. Uh, regeneration processes that are happening on land like this where the trees and the ground and soil and the grass and including the grazing are all working together to make a, a, a very healthy landscape. As you can see in the area there are not only old oaks, young oaks, multi-generational. Um, this land is healthy in that it has Resprouting trees, the trees work with the grass, with the grazing to keep this landscape in healthy, healthy shape. Your land is just beautiful. I can see why you'd fall in love with that. The open spaces in it and the beautiful blue oaks, which 
are increasingly scarce in our county. They're a special uh, biome, you know, small biome in mm. the oak savanna yeah. and chaparral main biome that we're in. Um, as I was talking about, we gradually got a bigger sense of what this land meant, not just to us, but under conservation easement to many, many people around us now and in the future. And this was really brought home the more we noticed the encroachment of suburban, smaller parcels, mm -hmm. more traffic, more people, that land being left to be habitat and productive agriculture was getting more and more precious and much more urgent to protect. So one of the things in having this larger piece of land that Anna was mentioning too is as land gets subdivided, there comes a point, this is somewhat of an opinion, where land stops being productive. The land that's in agriculture is productive. It's producing food, it's producing clean air, the habitat, um, you know, plants, trees, whatever. At some point when things get divided down, the land becomes consumptive in that you can't really do anything with the land. You have to live there, you have to get a job somewhere else, and it becomes a consumptive entity instead of a productive entity. So keeping this large body of land productive is probably, um, we hope, going to be of great value to the community in many years, to, you know, for many years to come. So now are you, uh, the provisions in your conservation easement, are all 800 acres available for, for your farming or ranching, or is there a limit to that? What, what, what are you protecting well, in your currently provisions? Currently now, um, about 100 acres is not under conservation easement yet, but all the rest of it is, in fact, under a conservation easement. Um, Probably, I think we've determined recently about 160 acres is in timber lot, which was replanted mm -hmm. after the 49er fire, and all of it is being used for grazing currently. Uh, provisions of the conservation easement, in fact, permit us to adjust, should it become necessary, some of the agricultural uses. Uh, an example of some of the particulars in the conservation easement, we set aside one small area, well that's actually probably about 60 acres, that's uh, we've deemed a blue oak preserve and to pre prevent that from being damaged, the blue oaks don't like irrigation, so there's a condition that that section cannot be irrigated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any agricultural use of that preserve needs to take into account the needs of the habitat that it's on. In other words, irrigation and blue oaks don't really get along, so any agricultural practices need to not include irrigation. So are there provisions for, say, overgrazing or you know, anything else or things we may not know about today? There, the, it, it has to be very carefully worded to preclude loopholes but to allow for flexibility for the unknowns that might arrive in the future. For instance, um, well, there our house is not included in, in, in the agricultural section. Um, so you don't really have to worry about irrigation or, you know, putting some gravel down for a driveway sort of thing. Um, let's see, where was I going with this? Um, <laughs> well, I wanted to ask actually a question here. You, part of your vision was originally self-reliance for yourselves in terms of or more self-sufficiency in terms of food. Uh, and to some extent, fuel. fuel as and fuel wood. and water, mm -hmm. right, for all of these for yourselves. And with the larger land, your, your, your vision changed. I would expect that it might have changed also when, you, when peak oil got on your radar screen. How did, how did that affect, has that affected your thinking at all about your, your land and your usage? Well, it's, it, it has affected things. Um, some of the things before, you know, it's one of those crunch things that before things get too expensive, we're trying to get enough of the infrastructure into the land itself, onto the ranch, so that it can become more of a contributor. And if nothing else, um, it's kind of vindicated our direction in that if we thought that this might be a value to the community in the future, now that we're, we have what can be land that's producing food, which can be used in the community, it may become much, much more important now to have this than we even thought of when we started out on it. 
we may begin to see this. This is one of our community assets, yours and other people's agricultural land that that's going to feed us in the future in the future decades, particularly as the, as the transportation costs rise and we can't afford to be flying in pineapples from Hawaii when you know when jet fuel is twenty times the cost it is now or whatever. Or Peak even, oil has definitely intensified yeah. our ideas about. I mean, you know, why why bring in beef food? from Argentina when it's right here? And is it being ranched right now? I mean, are you are you raising beef on your land or what? Yes, we have a person doing the actual ranching. We have this very cooperative arrangement where we own the land and he owns the cattle and he has all the cattle expertise. And what, what he is involved in and has kind of moved to the model of is grass-fed beef, which is raised from the grass that's growing on the land. And these animals are not sold into a commercial mechanism where they go to a feedlot and, and all the, the things that happen at feedlots that are undesirable. So grass-fed beef is very much more healthy for the cows, for the people who eat the beef, and for the landscape. So it's a very good arrangement to be doing that kind of food production uh, if one is thinking of land preservation and environmental effects. I would expect, if you're talking about being, you know, healthy for the land, or at least not overgrazing it, that there's got to be some limits to how many cattle he can be grazing there, because you're not bringing in extra, right? You're not, he's not bringing in extra feed from elsewhere. There is hay in the winter, uh -huh. and you know that's hopefully a resource that can be closer than, let's say, 200 miles. So it's within that at least few hundred mile radius of resource. That's one thing that I, I was forgetting what I was going to say. There are limits stated in the conservation easement. Um, it's fairly clear that no matter how intensively you try, there are a certain number of large herbivores that the land will not support and it should not be undertaken. Yeah, there it will be too much yeah, There the is land. a numerical limit mm -hmm. on the cattle on the ranch, but the other thing is with um, speaking of, or, uh, Jim Gates, who is our cattle person, um, he has been doing this for many, many years, and this goes to an interesting uh, phrase, which is a high eyes to acres ratio. And of course, high Jim, eyes, eyes to acres. To acres. And this means mm -hmm. that you really pay attention to what's going on on the land. You're watching the animals. You're seeing what's happened happening to the ground. You're seeing what's happening to the grass. You know when to move them in larger commercial operations that, you know, so many cattle, so many acres, let's see, it says here, you know, five, five acres per cow and that's it. You don't do that. You can see because, you know, there's, there are microclimates all over the ranch. Some places don't provide as much food for the cattle, other places do. So you have to be aware of this and manage the animals on the land appropriately. Yeah, nature is flexible rather than formulaic. And it changes year to year. I was saying, I mean, season. just I imagine drought or more rain or muddiness or whatever are all going to be factors that, that he's got to be watching. That's impressive how much work he must do to, yes. to, and the amount raise. of knowledge and, you know, not just sheer keeping after it, but the deep you know, sort of foundation of knowledge of how to manage land and cattle. That's a precious resource that is also looking a little dicey about going on into the future. Most ranchers and farmers, especially in Nevada County, are in their 50s or older. There are very few young farmers and ranchers. So this, this intelligence of how to, how to produce food in this local biosystem is very important to preserve as well. Is anybody working to, um, what, apprentice with Jim or make sure that that knowledge gets passed on to someone else? Because I could imagine that, as you, as you said, most of our farmers and ranchers are older. If they're not passing it on 20 years down the road, we're all going to be desperate to have what they knew how to do or, or will we create, reinvent the wheel or something? There, some of that knowledge is passed. There are wonderful 4-H and FFA programs available here. One of the problems is that there are younger people, kids, 4-H, FFA, who are interested in this, but 
our society some, somehow doesn't promote agriculture, cattle ranching, as much as it is, compounded by the fact that um, land as it is now valued, highest and best use, inevitably means subdividing it and developing it. The mechanism of the conservation easement to get back to that without getting into any financial details makes it much more feasible for someone of limited means to then buy the land and keep going on it. So it's more likely that agriculture can continue on this and it's more likely that a young person who may not have as much value as just the piece of land might be valued at if it were slated for a subdivision, that person will be able to buy the land and continue it in agriculture. And so there's, there's the path for the FFA or 4-H student who's interested in this. Have you begun to see any of that happening quite, or maybe too soon? And I mean, the, your easement it's is on, how old? It's, it's on, the, starting to on move. the radar screen, although another factor here is that ranching is difficult and very poorly paid and very insecure. And all those things, you know, we, our society tends to value, you know, TV and movie personalities mm -hmm. and sports stars and Wall Street people and big politicians, that sort, instead of the people who are really on the ground providing for our daily nourishment. I think that's we a bit of a turn that around, don't we? So that we start to, to, there, to yeah. put the you know to make it a status thing to be growing the food we need. I mean, we can survive without television. Some might argue that one, but we can't survive without eating. Yeah, yes, that, that's an interesting. I, I, the other day, I was trying to think of this you know importance pyramid, and I haven't really come up with a method yet. But what you're alluding to is is really important that people have to think what is most important to me. If I can't eat, nothing else matters. So there's food and there's shelter, and we somehow have these now kind of, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Somewhere well, we down. take them for granted. I mean, we're yes. living in this affluent, like I said earlier, this energy peak moment, and we've got, we've had so much abundant energy in the last 150 years, totally surplus, forgotten. that we, it's enabled us to do, to, to, to get further and further away from those essential, or to have surplus, and do and wonderful technology and not think yeah. about it. So we take for granted. I take for granted food, clean water, and that's starting to be more scarce, too, or, or of concern. Um, and I know that our farmers are not terrifically well paid. And as transportation costs rise, as they inevitably will, it will cost more to do food production. That's why local food is even more, you know, getting to be an important part of any community's agenda that, you know, as Bill was saying, you know, they, they raise a lot of grass-fed beef in Argentina, but that's, you know, a jet trip away. And when we can no longer do that, given the scarcity or the, you know, astronomical cost, local food production is going to be very much appreciated and valued. That's what we're hoping. Mm -hmm. We're hoping that there's enough of a, a realization in time to make either people tough enough to do farming and ranching or to make the, the, that job more attractive and to value it as it really should be in people's real lives. And so that we can be ready when, when we really need to eat locally. The um, Jim's, Jim's uh, operation, his, his cow calf operation, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, he, you were saying to me earlier that it's not, he doesn't do it even the way many grass-fed beef operations. Tell us a little bit about that. One reason is that given this Mediterranean climate, there's, you know, obviously a dry season during which irrigation is, is necessary and we're very lucky to have a good irrigation district, hopefully, that will be able to continue to provide this water in the summer. But um, the winter, the, as Bill was pointing out, the Jim's knowledge of exactly how much grass and what kind and how much nutrition is in the grass, that kind of fades to some extent in the winter. So there is supplemental feeding from hay, but it also means that the, the land itself does not support animals eating on it all year. So to shorten the cycle, uh, so that you don't have to keep additional animals over a year. Uh, 
you know, a cow is pretty much a year cycle. Um, to keep a, an animal for two years is a whole lot more stress on the land or a lot more stress on the pocketbook to buy more extraneous feed. So to get it down to where an animal can reach a reasonable eating weight uh, in a shorter time. And that's what he's managed to do with his deep knowledge of the land and how to manage the feed. He can bring animals to slaughter weight in under a year. Wow. Most operations have to go, most animals are slaughtered at between 20 and 28 months. This, the other corollary to that is that uh, people have to realize in local food with respect to beef, beef is a seasonal product, kind of like peaches and apples Never and things like that. Of it that way. So because the timing of slaughter and when the animals can be born depends on the climate, depends on the weather, depends on the feed. Beef or cows, cattle are slaughtered only at certain times. So, you know, if you don't want it, see, if you want fresh meat locally, you actually can only get at certain times of the year. Of course, you can freeze things and keep them. But we are so used to in this country buying just one little item and it's always going to be in the store somewhere, mm -hmm. no matter what time of the year it is. Um, that's another kind of issue we need to address in our society that the, the tremendous options we have for food are going to adjust to things being seasonal more and not everything is there all the time. Which takes us back, of course, to our, our ancestors who, who didn't have refrigeration because that's come with, with our fossil fuel age here. Um, how they preserved their, their meat, drying, smoking, other things. We may start mm -hmm. to see that kind of preservation having to happen. I mean, we will certainly have refrigeration mm -hmm. and, and so on. I think we'll relearn a lot of old ways and what's unique about the opportunity is that we have more knowledge and more technology, yes, that, that's not the sole answer. And we do have some problems, you know, overpopulation and um, overconsumption, but we have an opportunity to, to re-engage everybody with the earth that sustains them mm -hmm. in a new way. That's exciting. So hopefully we'll we'll get on board and start doing that. Thank you. And peak for... oil has kicked us into it. Well, that's the silver lining. I mean, that's the opportunity in this that we'll get reconnected. This has been fascinating. Thank you for being here. Any last Thank thoughts you. that we need to say here in our wrap up? You're pioneering. You know, you're you're creating a path here for us and for others. Thanks for watching Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson, and my guests Anna and Bill Trabuco. Join us next week for our half-hour edition of Peak Moment, 